computer. Okay, so the intermediate value theorem is a theorem that has very specific conditions that have to be satisfied. If those conditions are satisfied, then you get a nice result from that, okay? The first condition that has to be satisfied is that the function that you're looking at has to be continuous, okay? So if f is continuous on the interval a, b, okay? That interval could be the whole real number line. It could just be from one to seven, right? That interval can be any interval, but f has to be continuous on that interval. If f is not continuous, the intermediate value theorem tells you nothing, okay? If f is not continuous, the intermediate value theorem tells you nothing. The nice part about continuous is that when you start at one place and end in another place, you know you have to touch every y value between them, yeah? If my function is continuous and I start at one place, end at another place, the only way to get there is by touching every number in between them. I could touch it many times, right? I could do a lot of wiggles and touch that number many times, but at least once I have to touch every y value between those two starting and ending points. If my function wasn't continuous, I could just jump right over it, right? I could have some sort of jump discontinuity in the middle. I could jump right over it and miss the y value I'm looking for, okay? So if f is continuous on an interval a, b, then for any y value between f of a and f of b. Get mad at my student workers. For any y value between f of a and f of b, um, there exists a c such that f of c equals that y value. Let's think about it in terms of a picture. Here's A, here's B. Here's F of A, here's F of B. Since my function is continuous, any Y value I pick between F of A and F of B will get touched by at least one X value. That's what the intermediate value theorem says. Any Y value that gets picked between f of a and f of b will get touched somewhere between that interval because the function is continuous. Otherwise, I could just skip right over that point. If it was discontinuous, put a jump there, skip right over that y value, nothing happens. So this is the super important part to remember is that your function has to be continuous. So when you're working on your homework, they're gonna say, does the intermediate value theorem apply to this function? And you're gonna have to think, is it continuous or not? If so, what can I do with it, okay? So let's try it. It says, use the intermediate value theorem to answer the following questions. If my function is x cubed minus two x minus five. So if my function is x cubed minus two x minus five, is that a continuous function? Yeah, there's no denominators, there's no square roots, there's no piecewise, right? It's a Nice polynomial function that's just gonna come up and wiggle and maybe go back down. So yes, this guy is continuous. Step number one, check and make sure your function is continuous. Check, okay. It says find f of one. How do you find f of one? Plug one in for x, perfect. One cubed, two times one minus five. One minus two minus five is negative six. Okay, so f of one is negative six. Find f of two. Okay, great, f of two. Two cubed minus two times two minus five. Um, eight minus four, four minus five, negative one. Check, I don't know. The first one, uh, one minus two minus five, yeah? Okay, one more, f of three. Three cubed minus two times three minus five. Three cubed, 27, minus six, 21, minus five, 16. Someone has a calculator. Yeah, 16, okay. The question says, 
Does the function have a zero? And how do you know? So what does it mean for the function to have a zero? A zero is a place where the function crosses the x-axis, where the y value is zero, right? So does the function have a zero? Does the function have a place where the y value is zero? Yes, how come? Yes. Yes. So somewhere between x equals two and x equals three. Somewhere between x equals two and x equals three, there has to be a zero. At x equals two, the function is a negative number. At x equals three, the function is a positive number. If you are negative at two and positive at three, and you're continuous, the only way to get there is to cross through zero. So we know that at two, the function is down here at negative one. At three, the function is up here at 16. 16, drawing not to scale. 16, negative one. The only way to get there is to cross through the x-axis somewhere between two and three. So we're gonna say yes. By the intermediate value theorem, since f of two is negative and f of three is positive, it must cross the x-axis somewhere between there. Does the intermediate value theorem tell you that there aren't any other zeros? Could there be a zero between one and two? So at x equals one, the y value was negative. At x equals two, the y value was negative. Does that mean that there aren't any zeros between one and two? It doesn't, right? Because the function could do this. Yeah? So the intermediate value theorem can only tell you what definitely happens. It can't tell you what doesn't happen or what might not happen, okay? The intermediate value theorem only tells you things that definitely happen. So we say, does it have a zero? Yes, because at two, the value of the function is negative. At three, the value of the function is positive. It's continuous. So to get from negative to positive, you have to cross the x-axis. You have to have a zero. I am ready for homework questions. I'm not, it's putting them at the top of the screen. It is what it is. I'm, I'm not ready for homework questions. I wanted to be ready for homework questions, but I'm literally not. I don't have Infinity open or anything. So give me uh, two seconds. This one, review. Okay, I am now ready for homework questions. Eight, 12, 8, 12, 6, 8, 12, 6. Okay, I took out a question the other day. Everyone was looking like yesterday at these numbers, right? Okay, 8. Oh, I gotta get that snipper thing out again. Eight, twelve, yep, six.
8, 12, 6, 13. A blank page there. It's fine. Okay, I'm starting with eight. Eight. No, I don't want to write with that. This one. Eight. Find the values of C and D that make this function continuous. What do you have to figure out to make a piecewise function continuous? Yeah, each piece has to have the same value. So where it changes from one piece to another, you need to make sure that the values are the same. So we're going to look at two places. We're going to look at what happens at one when it changes from this top function to the bottom function to the middle function. And then we're going to look at what happens at two when it changes from the middle function to the bottom function. So we're going to look at what happens at one. I want both sides of one to be equal. And then I'm going to do the same thing on both sides of two. Okay, so in this first piece on the right side of one, if I'm on the right side of one, I'm using numbers that are slightly larger than one. So I'm using this middle function and I'm gonna plug in one for X. In the second piece where one minus, so I'm looking at numbers that are slight, slightly smaller than one. So I'm looking at the top function where the numbers are slightly smaller than one. I'm gonna plug in one for X and I'm gonna get eight. So this tells me that C plus D equals eight. Yeah. I'm gonna do the same thing at two. In this first piece, I'm using the numbers that are slightly smaller than two. The numbers slightly smaller than two are going into that middle function. In the second piece, I'm coming to two from the right. So I'm using the numbers that are slightly larger than two. The number slightly larger than two go into that second function. Okay, so this is 4C plus D is 14. So C plus D is eight. That came from my uh, looking at one. And then 4C plus D is 14. That came from looking at what happens at two. So now I have a system of equations. C plus D is eight and 4C plus D is 14. I have a system of equations. How do you solve a system of equations? Everybody has their favorite method. Which one is yours? Elimination is a great method. Graphing and finding where they intersect is another great method. Matrices, another great method, right? Whatever your favorite method is for solving a system of equations, you should use that, okay? Whatever your favorite method is for solving a system of equations, you should use that. Um, this one's not a hard system, so elimination is pretty easy. Solve that guy for D, plug him in here. So 4C plus 8 minus C is 14. Uh, 3C, because I have 4 minus 1. 3C plus 8 is 14. 3C is 6. C is 2. Um, to get D, I have 8 minus C. So D is eight minus two or six. So C was two, D was six. So if this middle function was two X squared plus six, then it would be continuous all the way across. It might be blocky, but it'll be continuous all the way across. You could graph it in Desmos and see that it's continuous. So once you get to this point where you have the two equations, use your favorite method, whether it's graphing and find their intersection, whether it's matrices, whether it's elimination, whether it's substitution, whatever your favorite method is for solving a system of equations. Yes, sir. Yeah. I need to scroll up some more so it's easier. Oh, I forgot what number this, oh, eight, great. Eight. 
Which one's this? Who remembers which number this is? 12? 13? This is 12. <laughs> okay, this one says, from the intermediate value theorem. Oh, what do you have to know about the intermediate value theorem? It has to be continuous. From the intermediate value theorem, is it guaranteed that there is a root of the given equation in the given intervals? So does this equation, cube root of x equals one minus x, have a solution on the interval negative one to zero? I think this is an easier question to answer if you get everybody on one side and zero on the other side. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rewrite this equation as cube root of x minus one plus x equals zero. So does this equation have a solution on the interval negative, zero, negative one to zero? Is this function continuous? Yeah, cube root, you can put in any number you want, right? If it was a square root, then you'd say no, but cube root, you can put in negative numbers if you want to, yeah? So if it was an even root, you'd have to say no because you can't plug in negatives. But because it's an odd root, cube root, you can plug in any number you want. So continuous, check. What's the next thing you have to check? If you wanna know if there's a zero on this interval, what do you have to look at? The value, yeah, you need at negative one and at zero, you need one of them to be below and one of them to be above, right? If one of these numbers is below and the other is above, then you can say yes. If they're both below or both above, you have to say, no, it might, but we can't tell that by the intermediate value theorem. So I'm gonna plug in negative one, cube root negative one, minus one, minus one. Negative one. Okay, then I'm gonna plug in zero. Cube root zero, minus one, plus zero, minus one. Oh, so sad. So, so sad. I got two numbers that are down here. Is there a zero? Maybe. Does the intermediate value theorem tell you there is? Nope, big old no. If these two values, if the two y values are, do not, are not on opposite sides of the x-axis, you can't say anything. It might happen, might not happen, but the intermediate value theorem doesn't tell you that it does or not. Um, so the things you should think about not being continuous are denominators and square roots, or even power roots. Other things are pretty much always continuous. Maybe tangents, if they get to those, because basically you want to think about if there's like a place, you could graph it as well. You could graph this and see that it's like continuous. But basically, if there's no denominators and there's no even power roots, then it's pretty much continuous. There is, yeah. It could still be, but the intermediate value theorem doesn't tell us that it is. So this question is just asking, does the intermediate value theorem tell you that one happens there? So that's why the calculator is not really going to help because it might cross there and you're like, yeah, it crosses, but the intermediate value theorem doesn't tell you it has to. Okay, this guy. Who knows this number? Not eight, six, this one's six. Six, six is gonna be in green on this, six. Use interval location to, con to indicate where this function is continuous. Where might this function be discontinuous? Where the denominator equals zero. This guy might be discontinuous where the denominator equals zero. So this is discontinuous when the denominator x squared minus seven x plus 10 equals zero. Okay, how are you gonna solve that guy? Factor or quadratic formula, complete the square, or whatever your favorite method is. I get x equals five and x equals two. So this guy is discontinuous at x equals five and x equals two. That means when you graph this function, it's either gonna have an asymptote or a hole at five and two. When you graph that function, it's either gonna have an asymptote or a hole at x equals five and x equals two. 
So if it's discontinuous at those two places, where is it continuous? Everywhere else. Um, it might be easiest if you put them on a number line, two, five, put some holes there. You need these three intervals. So negative infinity to two, two to five, and five to infinity. <coughs> I'm dying. I'm not really dying. Everybody ready? I don't want to move if you're not ready. Okay. This one was 13. Wait, 13. Let me uh, make it a little bit bigger. The table below gives for the value of continuous function f. Ooh, that's the table below gives the values of a continuous function f at each x value. Using the intermediate value theorem and the information in the table, determine the smallest interval in which the function must have a root. So we want to determine where the function is going to have a root. The intermediate value theorem tells me that if the function is positive and then turns to negative, what has to happen? It has to cross the x-axis. If the function is positive and then turns to negative, it has to cross the x-axis. Here's what I know. This function is positive here, 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 and here. Yeah? And then it turns to negative down here. So what can you say? Somewhere between two and three, two and three, this function has to have a zero. So two to three, let's make that our interval. Does that mean that it doesn't happen between, you know, negative two and negative one? No, it just means it's guaranteed to happen between two and three. That's the smallest interval we can place it on. We could have done it from like negative three to, to negative five, right? At negative three, it's a positive value. At negative five, it's a negative value. You know, it has to cross somewhere between there, but we want to get the littlest interval we can. So we know that that zero is somewhere between two and three. Other questions from that? Stop my recording. <laughs>